know, chipping doesn't have to be that hard. In these next three videos, I'm going to share with you some of the real secrets to making chipping easy. People have told me time and time again this has helped them tremendously on their short game, and I can't wait to share it with you. Let's go and get started. Now, if you're struggling with the wedges, I have got the absolute best solution you've ever seen. You see, pros do this one thing right, and that's launch the ball less than 30 degrees. It's extremely important, and the only way that you can launch it less than 30 degrees is to have lag and to have shaft lean at impact, so the shaft's gotta be leaning forward in front of the club head. If you don't do that, which almost every single player that I've ever worked with doesn't do that, every recreational player, if you don't do that one thing, wedges are gonna be impossible. You'll hit one 60 yards, the next one goes 40, the next one shoots over the green thin, chunks, everything you can do wrong, you name it, that's gonna happen. So that's the magic in wedges. I've gotta get the shaft forward, and I've gotta get this to launch 30 degrees or less. If I can do that, gonna be fantastic. So here's a great way to measure that, even if you don't have any of this fancy equipment that I have here. Now I've got my Flight Scope X3. It's gonna tell me my launch angle down here at the bottom of the screen. It's handy if you have one of those, but there's a, there's a real easy way to do it. I'm gonna measure from some point where I can see my ball fly and compare it to a wall or a ceiling or an alignment stick or something like that. I'm just gonna walk and see how many feet it is from where I'm hitting my golf ball to where I measure it. So I'm gonna walk one, two, three, four, five paces. I'm about 15 feet from where I'm hitting my ball until it hits the screen. Now, at that point, if I went 15 feet forward and 15 feet up, that would make a 45 degree angle. I wanna launch it less than 30. So I'm gonna go two thirds of the height. So if I go 15 feet forward, instead of going 15 feet up, I'm gonna go 10 feet up. Now that just so happens to be the top of my screen here. That's 10 feet high. So I know if I hit that golf ball and it hits the top of this screen, that's at a 30 degree angle, and that's the absolute maximum that I wanna hit this golf ball. Now I'm gonna cut into this video for just one second. I know if you're great at math, this video is absolutely driving you nuts because the real math would say this is really 8.9 feet or whatever that is. But for the purpose of this, two thirds is easier to do and plenty good for what we need. Back to the video. Now in a second, I'm gonna teach you a drill that's gonna give you a surefire way to keep it below that, but you can measure this however you want. You could also take something like this. I just have a pull noodle on this stick here. This is a flag stick, uh, like you'd hang a flag from your house. It's got an alignment rod on it and a pull noodle on it. That's also set about at that same angle. I could set that there and I could try to keep this ball below, launching below the pull noodle. I could stick a alignment stick in the ground. I could do it a variety of ways. But let's go ahead and hit one here. Notice where it hits up on the screen and you're gonna see as long as it's below the top, I'm well within range of where I need to be. Whack the pull noodle there just a little bit, had a little too close to me. But you can see that was perfect. A little half swing sand wedge didn't swing hard at all. A little half back swing coming on through. That ball went 87 yards carry distance and 26.7 launch angle. 26.7 is below 30. I'm gonna hit it like a tour pro if I can do that. Now, now we have a way of measuring it to know if we're doing it right. Now we know the difference between what the pros are doing and why almost everybody struggles with the wedges. How do we learn it for ourselves? Well, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take that wedge and I want you to set it up about a club head width off the inside of your back foot. So if I have my feet about two head club head widths apart, if I wanna go a little farther swing, I may go three club head widths apart. Doesn't matter, it's just gonna be a little bit narrower than a full swing. Just makes it easier to, to have control. I'm gonna put that ball about one club head width inside my back foot. I'm gonna flare open my front foot, which is gonna help me to rotate through that shot and get the shaft leaning forward more easily. Now from here, I wanna make sure that I have a lot of lag. And if I get down in the bottom of the swing, when my club's parallel to the ground, I wanna see the butt end of the club over top of the golf ball. That's gonna ensure that if I get in this position, as I rotate on through, I'm gonna have a lot of shaft lean. Now, if the butt end of the club reaches the golf ball and my club is way down here, I've cast the club, I've flipped it, and I'm gonna scoop it, I'm gonna be a terrible wedge player. There's really nothing more to it than that. So, I'm gonna do some little practice swings, butt end of the club over top of the golf ball, club still parallel with the ground. Now, this would be parallel with my target line. You can see my alignment stick, the line on the screen, this would be parallel. I actually wanna make sure that I hit a draw on these wedge shots. So I'm gonna take this club and just pull it a little bit inside. I'm gonna exaggerate here and go about 10 or 15 degrees inside. And I'm gonna imagine that I'm swinging 10 or 15 degrees outside. So my club is swinging in this direction rather than straight down the target line. 
Now the reason for that is a little bit of a cheat that makes it easier for players. You see, if I swing to the right, I can actually close my club face a little bit more, which takes loft off the club. Most players struggle getting it de-lofted enough. This makes it easier to have happen. It also ensures that you're gonna get a nice little draw, so the ball turns over from right to left, and it makes it just a little bit more fun to play golf because everything gets more consistent. So now I'm gonna feel this. I'm gonna swing out that direction, and I wanna make sure that I keep it below the top of that screen. So there, again, not a very hard swing. It drew from right to left, 90 yards with a sand wedge. That's nowhere near a full swing. You can put out very little effort and hit it very far and very solid and, and straight if you do it this way. So again, watch my backswing. I'm only gonna take it back to here, and then I wanna make a full follow through, and it's gonna be around that 90 yard mark again. Just a hair thin on the wedge. Again, nice draw, 91 yards again. Good swing there. I'm gonna go about halfway back again, and I'm still gonna get 90 with that sand wedge. Another one, all these below the top of the screen, all of them drawn from right to left. That one was just a few yards shorter than that. You're seeing just with a little half swing, I can get it almost 90 yards and have it be really solid each time. Now finally, there's one last trick to making this as easy as possible. I'm gonna go ahead and set up an impact bag. Now, iLine Golf makes this particular impact bag. You can get whatever you want. You can even uh, wad up a bunch of towels, some dirty clothes, whatever you wanna do to make it easy for you. You don't have to have this one, but I like this one because it also has a little ramp on the front of it to mimic that shaft lane. So this is the wedge impact cube here. And you can see that the shaft now matches up with the angle of this when I'm doing my wedges the right way. So I like it for that. I also like it to where I can put this impact bag to where it's in line with my golf ball. So now what I have to do, I'm gonna put this golf ball about a foot in front of this impact bag. I don't know if my flight scope will read it when it's doing this, but I got the golf ball about a foot in front of the bag. The bag is in line with the golf ball. Now I have to swing inside and really de-loft it to hit that nice draw when I have this little impact bag there. Again, below the top of the screen, 89 yards, little half swing, very repeatable when you do it this way. Now, we get a few bucks. You'll see a link down below in the description somewhere on this page. You'll see a link if you wanna buy one of these. It helps us support the channel. We get a few bucks from uh, iLine Golf. When you do those, again, you don't have to buy it. Roll up some, some towels, do whatever you want to. is gonna be completely fine. But I do like that one. If you're looking for something like that, that's the one that I like, that I recommend. All right, today we're gonna to talk about how to hit those wedges that have one hop and stop, nice spin on them, really good action. There's a few key things you can do that make this a lot easier and to know how to spot the right conditions where you can hit those spinning shots. Let's go and get started. All right, so let's dive right into it. This video isn't gonna to be tons of fluff. I'm gonna get right into the technique and we're gonna talk about how to do this. Piece number one, you wanna make sure that you're really aggressive, accelerate with your body and accelerate through the shot. So if I have a little shorter backswing and I really move on through there aggressively, I don't wanna to start to slow down. When my body slows down, what ends up happening is my hands and wrists take over, I start to flip it a little bit, and that's that shot that drives us crazy where it just kinda of floats up in the air, not much spin, a lot of times it lands short of the green, really, really aggravating. It's nice to have those low penetrating shots that cut through the, the, through the wind, stay nice and low, tons of spin on them so we can hit over a bunker or something like this and then really get the ball to grab. So that's the first key, have to be really aggressive through there when I'm hitting this shot. Number two, I like to open my stance a little bit and preset my hips a little bit open. If I do that, so if I go ahead and open my feet slightly, I'll even have my right foot slightly open here along with my left foot, that's gonna help me to open everything up. As I start to open everything up, that makes it easier to get this shaft leaning forward so I can make a cleaner contact on this ball. Now I'm gonna hit a few, some of them are gonna be good, some of them aren't gonna be that good. We're gonna to try to hit a nice low spinners on every single one of these. So now, aggressive through the shot, I've opened both my feet up and I really feel like I'm gonna pinch this ball into the turf, kind of smush it against the club face. Uh, not too good on that one, hit a little off the heel, but not too bad, definitely a decent shot up there. Not as much spin as the one before. 
So the, the third key here, we've got our aggressive acceleration through the ball, we've got our feet open. Let's talk about why we want to have our body open, why we want that forward shaft lane. There's something called, a lot of people refer to this as spin loft mountain. And basically what this says is, if you can kind of imagine my angle of attack or how I'm hitting into the ground is fairly level. I'm taking a little bit of a divot here, but I'm not chopping way down into it. Hitting down just very slightly. Now, if I don't have very much loft on this face, then it's not gonna create much backspin. Imagine I had a sledgehammer and I'm just hitting this golf ball with my sledgehammer. It's gonna knock it up there. It's gonna be low because there's no loft on the sledgehammer, but it's just a knuckleball. The ball's not gonna have any backspin at all. As I start to add more and more loft, the difference between how I'm hitting down in the ball, which would be this angle, so say I'm hitting down very slightly, and the difference in loft on my face starts to get bigger. So here's the sledgehammer, swinging level, no loft. As I start to add loft to my club face, that creates more spin. So this is a, what they call spin loft, and the more spin loft you get, or the bigger the difference between the direction the club's swinging and the loft on the face, the bigger the difference between those two, the more spin you're gonna get. That's why you always wanna use like a 60 degree wedge or, or at worst a 56 degree wedge when you're doing this. So as I add more and more and more loft, all the way up to, uh, you know, playably, kind of high 40s, low 50s amount of loft on the face, that's gonna give me the most spin. If I keep on adding loft, so kind of imagine as a mountain, as I get more and more loft, spin goes up and up and up. It kind of reaches that max around 50 degrees or so, and then it starts to lose a little bit of spin because I lose friction. There's a little bit of dirt in the way, there's a little bit of water in the way, whatever it is, you lose a little bit of friction between the club face and the ball. So as I add too much loft and I have this face way open like this, like a flop shot, it will go high, but it won't have any spin on it. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to take a lofted wedge so that I keep that loft up to get the spin, but I'm also making sure that I can be nice and consistent and hit ball first by de-lofting it and swinging through. If I took a lower lofted club, like a pitching wedge or a nine iron, and I went ahead and flipped it and got the same amount of loft as I'm doing here, you really wouldn't get the spin because my strike would be too inconsistent. You wouldn't really get that compression on the golf ball, or it would be, you know, one of them you compress, one of them you wouldn't compress. It's tougher to control it. So again here, now that we realize that, I have my 60 degree wedge. I'm gonna play that ball when my feet are open. If you're looking at it from my left heel, it's just barely behind my left heel. If I add my right foot in there, it's kind of just in front of my right foot. And that's about where I like to play it to really allow myself to hit down slightly, have the shaft leaning forward, and still get some pretty good spin. So again, I got my 60 degree wedge, and because I'm opening, my shaft is really gonna lean ahead. I'm gonna de-loft this club slightly. I'm gonna get around that 50 degree spin loft. Oh, and that one I chunked a little bit. Didn't quite hit it as well, so not as much spin on it. Still a decent shot, but you'll notice how that one rolled out a little bit. And that's gonna bring me my, my next key here is not every single shot you're gonna spin. No matter how good you get at these, unless you're on PGA Tour, you're not gonna just spin the cover off of every single one of them. You have to hit it nice and clean. If I get anything between my face and the ball, that causes it to slide. The ball doesn't grab the face, it slides up it. So even a little bit of dirt on the face, uh, a little bit of grass, a little bit of water, anything like that is really gonna cause it to lose some spin. So you have to have your wedge really, really clean. So here, I like to keep a little brush with me. I don't know if you can see this on camera, but I just have a little brush on my bag and I just wipe off the face, keep that nice and dry and clean, keep all the stuff out of the grooves. Grooves actually are misunderstood. If you don't have any grooves on the wedge, it creates just as much spin if there's nothing between the ball and the club. It's like drag slicks on a drag car. No grooves, all rubber to pavement, pure friction. Same thing with a wedge. But in reality, every time you hit, there's a little bit of grass, a little bit of water, something getting between your club face and the, and the, and the middle of the club, or the ball in the middle of the club. And that's why you'll see little pieces of grass on your club face for where it impacted. Every time that happens, you need those grooves to allow that debris to go into the groove and for the face to grab the ball. If you had a perfect lie, you're setting it up off a tee or something like that, you wouldn't even need grooves on the club. That's why you spin it so much. Sometimes when you're on AstroTurf mats, you can really get a lot of spin on there. So here, again, I don't wanna get much stuff between my club face and the ball. So the next thing is, 
when I, when I do this, I wanna visualize like I'm staying pretty low to the ground and I'm just kind of brushing the turf. I am gonna get a little bit of a divot, but it's not gonna really chop down a ton. You can have some good spin if you chop way down on it, but it's kind of hit or miss because sometimes you'll hit a little bit too far behind it. It won't really spin like you want it to. There we go, that's a nice one. It's gonna be a little short. Kicked off that downslope, but that had a lot of spin on it. Just got a, not the best kick because of the, the downslope there. All right, so now let's talk about what we're gonna do with our hips and then our hands and our arms. I open my feet so that when I hit this shot, my hips can open up. I really want them leading the way. Again, that's gonna help me deal off the club like I need to. It's gonna help me have the hands leading the way to be consistent. And I'm really gonna be aggressive through the ball if I can have those hips kind of leading the way as I'm doing that. That one's got a ton of spin on it, a little low one. So we one stop and really check up. So that thing's coming in low, but then it's trying to grab there at the end. Uh, so the, the hips are really key to that. Feel like your hips are opening up as that's happening. And feel like your belt buckle, especially, is facing the target. Now the last piece here again, I have to take a little bit of loft off this club so that I can be consistent and I can, I can get the spin on there. Here's the move that most people get wrong when they're trying to take loft off the club. You don't simply push the face forward or push the hands forward. When you do that, look at my club face. It's gonna open up the club face. And when I try to hit, the, just move the hands forward and hit that shot, it ends up going way to the right. Not a very good shot. I left it short of the green. It's not really compressed like I want it to be. The key there is that you have to deal off the club by rolling the wrist or turning the wrist. So if you imagine, I'm gonna make a little setup position here. And when I come to contact, my hands are actually gonna be like this. I'm turning that club face down. The only reason the face is square is because I have the shaft lean forward, all right? So if I, if I keep the club shaft straight up and down, there's my impact position. The only difference is when I really impact the ball, I'm actually gonna be here like this with the shaft lean forward. If I'm looking at it from this down the line view, as I'm coming into the ball, I'm rolling the face closed a little bit, and then I'm really pinching it, compressing it against the ground, or what feels like it's against the ground, covering that to really get a lot of the spin, a lot of the bite on it. I'm gonna go ahead and clean up this wedge one more time, and we'll try to get a nice low one, again, with a lot of good spin on it. Yeah, I hit that one nicely. So those are the keys to really getting those wedges to stop, check up for you. Number one, I'm gonna open my stance a little bit. Number two, I'm gonna keep the club nice and clean. I have to have a nice lie, it can't be wet. I can't have a lot of stuff behind the golf ball like being the rough, it's not gonna spin very much. I'm gonna have my hands leaning forward, really compressing the golf ball. My hips are leading the way, and then the real secret to this, I have to have this de-lofting with my wrist, like I'm rotating this club. If I can put those together, then I can really pinch that ball, get a lot of spin on it. Now, if you can keep this string tight in your pitch shots, you're gonna be a pretty daggone good pitcher of the golf ball. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna go ahead and put that on my grip. I'm gonna have a little bit of tension on this string, and then I'm gonna keep that tension the entire way back and through. Now, you see the reason this is so important is whenever my arm bends, so my right elbow starts to bend, notice what that does to the club face. It pulls it way up off the ground or extends it way down into the ground. And when you start changing that angle, one swing you're gonna thin it, the next swing you're gonna chunk it. So a great solution to that is go ahead and set up, just tie a normal string around one of the shirt buttons on your shirt. And then you're gonna pull that a little bit tight and kind of tuck it under your, your left thumb just so you can hold on to it or you know, just hold on to it wherever you want to under your fingers. Doesn't really matter how you hold the string on there. But I just want a little slight bit of tension on there. So you can see this is kind of pulling my shirt slightly. And then as I go back, I'm gonna feel like I keep that tension. What I don't wanna do is bend these arms and all of a sudden this goes slack. Imagine this is my low point control. If I can keep the same amount of tension on this the entire time, that's gonna control my low point and I'll be able to hit really clean chips and pitches. It'll be super easy. So the great thing about that is if I can control this and I have great feedback, I'll hit the ground consistently. And if I hit the ground consistently, that's really the name of the game. When you hit your bad chips and pitches, it's not because you missed it 10 feet to the right. How often do you just hit one 20 feet to the right of the hole that was nice and cleanly struck 
it just never happens. It's all about distance control, and that's mostly about hitting it solid. If I chunk one, it goes nowhere, and I got a long putt. If I thin it, it shoots past the hole. That's the name of the game. So instead of getting worried about all kinds of things, let's master this, and it's easy. All right, so the first thing is, how do I keep that right arm straight? Well, if my shoulders don't move, let's say that my hips and my shoulders stay perfectly still. I'm gonna try to keep this arm straight, but I can only go to about right here, and then my arms have to bend to keep the club moving. You see, because my shoulders moving is what allows me to keep that right arm straight. So let me go ahead and grab this string again. Okay, so from here, if my shoulders rotate, now all of a sudden, I can go back as far as I want and still keep that arm pretty straight. And again, that's gonna control my low point. So let's start from the ground up and talk about how we do that. A wide stance is a big no-no here. When I have a wider stance, I'm gonna to tend to lock my knees, lock my hips, and then I start using all arms, changing that angle again. I wanna put my heels, really, I'd love to have them the closer together, the better. For some players, I'd even recommend starting out with your heels touching. So your ankles are touching, let your front foot open up a little bit, and what that allows you to do, again, is it allows you to rotate your knees and your body to allow your shoulders and your hips to rotate to allow that right arm to stay still. The left foot being open just helps you to pivot through it a little bit more. Imagine a pitch is like tossing a golf ball to the screen where your knees pivot and your feet are opening up make that easier. Same thing with my belt buckle. I'm imagining that turning back and through as I'm hitting this pitch shot. I don't wanna lock this in. Sure, you could do that for a little bump and run shot, but anything with any kind of distance at all, you look at the pros, they're gonna be pivoting those knees. They're gonna be pivoting those hips, so that belt buckle is gonna be moving. Now from there, now that I have everything moving, my shoulders are gonna be moving, and I can almost imagine like if I had a big pail of water, a heavy bucket of water, that's how I'd swing that. I'd be letting everything in my body kind of move that back and through. I wouldn't be moving that heavy bucket like this with just my hands and arms. So feet close together, left foot open. Let my knees pivot, my belt buckle pivot, my shoulders are gonna rotate. And then from there, I can go ahead and just keep a little bit of tension in this string, and that's gonna allow me to have really great low point control. So now I can hit the ground at the same point every time, and it's not unless I bend this arm and the string goes slack, or I throw the arm and the string really gets tighter, that I'm gonna have struggle with that low point control. So here again, let's go ahead and hit a nice little pitch. And it's just easy to hit it clean. Let's have my radar lined up a little awkward, a little sideways because I hit that right dead in the center of the screen there. But that was an easy, nice, clean shot. Now, the last piece here is you can have a little bit of flow. I don't want to be dead armed with my wrist. I don't want to feel like this is locked in, no wrist movement whatsoever, and I'm just going back and forth like that. I do want to have a little bit of flow, almost like I'm tossing the club, tossing a golf ball. So if you imagine if you had a golf ball in your hand, and you're gonna go ahead and let this kind of lag behind and just toss it toward the target, your wrist would be loose. You'd be letting that go this way. You wouldn't be just trying to muscle it through with your hand and arm locked. You'd go ahead and have a little flow to it. That's the same thing that's happening here when you're hitting these pitch shots. Let the wrist have a little bit of flow. Almost imagine it like a little gate and it's going back and forth this way, but it's not necessarily rolling over a ton, opening and closing just kind of back and forth, just like if you were tossing a golf ball toward the target. So it's not doing a bunch of different angles, it's just swinging back and through, which keeps the face nice and square. So keeping tension on this keeps your low point in control. Having that wrist be nice and soft and loose helps you get a feel for how hard to hit it and be able to be, you know, have a lot of touch around the greens. Let's try another one out. There we go, really nice and solid again, right in the dead center of the screen. Couldn't hit any cleaner than that. Now, you may be asking yourself, well, okay, I get the basic motion there, and I understand that I can hit it solid, and pitching's gonna be really easy now, but how do I control the distance? We talked about that tossing motion, but what if I get a little bit farther than that? What if I get that 30, 40, 50, 60 yards out? That's a little bit longer than a pitch. How do contr pros control those shots? How do they seem to get it right on the number? Well, there's a system that I like to use that a lot of people have heard of, but they always use it the wrong way. And in this system, we measure how far we swing back and through to judge the distance that we're gonna hit. You see, most people are missing this one piece of it. It's not how far back and through you swing that makes it work. It's something else that I'm gonna share with you 
in this next video. So I'm going to play a preview of that here in a second. Just go ahead and click the card that you see up on your screen. If you don't see one of those cards, just go down to the description down below, click the link there, and I can't wait to show, with you, show you this method to dial in your wedge distances and just become a master around the greens. It's the best next step to add now that you're pitching it great. Let's go and get started. Well, I used to actually practice a lot in high school. This is one of my favorite things to do. I had a, a strip mowed down the back of my yard where I took the lawnmower. My parents probably hated this because I mowed it down to like half inch turf in the back of the yard because we lived on a farm. And I would set buckets or towels along this and I would try to set them at those distances that I knew. And maybe I, I knew my, my 56 degree went right at 65 yards. So I'd set a bucket 65 yards away and I would go ahead and do my nine o'clock swing and I would try to fly it right into the bucket. And I'd be, get to where I could, I could tell for sure if I was gonna be a couple yards short or a couple yards long, just because it gets so ingrained when you get the rhythm and the finish the same every time. So we can use different length backswings to control the distance of our wedge shots. So for example, if we imagine that I'm a clock and six o'clock is directly down, my wedge would be at six o'clock or my, my arms would be at six o'clock. I can go back to a 7.30 swing and I can have the same finish and hit it a certain distance, or I can go back to nine or 10.30 and swing through to the same distance. And that's gonna control, or the same finish point, and that's gonna control the distance that my wedge shots are gonna fly in the air. And I've gotta keep that ry rhythm and that tempo very, very consistent. If I vary my tempos, I can hit it all kinds of different distances. So for example, I could have a real quick tempo, 7.30 swing, and probably hit this 90 yards. I could have a, maybe not really that far, probably 50 or 60 yards. I could have a very slow, slow tempo 730 swing and hit half that distance. So I've got to get my distance the same. I've got to get my rhythm the same. That's the real key to it. And the second piece on there.